take you to Sinai. Well, I was interested to go to St. Catherine's where this manuscript, this famous manuscript on which all modern translations are based, was found. Here it is, St. Catherine's Protectorate. This is the monastery, the famous monastery. Here are the skulls of the monks that uh, were active there. And if you like, you can pray to them and get a blessing. They will answer you, apparently. I, I didn't see any possibility of answering me. They had no breath in them, but nevertheless, you can if you want to. This is Sinai, so they say. And in the church you find the symbols of sun and moon and all the pagan symbols. The famous Sinai Library, uh, where this was found, where you have all these ancient handwritten codices, these ancient manuscripts, and the famous Codex Sinaiticus, which was found by Tischendorf in 1844. So there we have it. So it was handed over to Catholic scholars in 1844, and... Uh, from the University of Leipzig. Interesting date. That's Codex Sinaiticus. There you have some of the ancient manuscripts that are in that place. And uh, some interesting history about this monastery. The ben benevolent treatment of the monastery of Sinai by the Arabs. It was never destroyed by the Arabs. So Islam had no quarrel with them. Who took the peninsula in the 7th century is due to the patent of Muhammad and its protection with rights and privileges which Prophet Muhammad, founder of Islam, granted to the monks of the monastery of Sinai. So Muhammad protected this monastery. Who else protected it? Well, here's another interesting document. Napoleon Bonaparte, who was a 33-degree Freemason. By the way, if there was such a thing in those days, his brother was the Grand Master in Spain and he was a high Freemason. Those degrees had not yet existed at that stage to that degree, but he was one of the highest initiates. He protected this monastery. Interesting people protected this monastery. This is the famous Four Gospels of Codex Sinaiticus. That's my friend over there. We're going into the monastery and some of the paintings in the monastery. And then this fascinating bush over here with all these people lining up to pray in front of this bush. This is a famous bush. In fact, this bush has survived for thousands of years and has never, ever been watered. Never been watered. In fact, it is one of the most famous bushes in the history of the world. It is the famous burning bush that Moses bowed down to, so they say. They told us it had never been watered. I was inquiring what that pipe was there, <laughs> but they in insisted that it was a, a dead pipe, which it was. There was no water in it, but I, it's a very prickly bush, so I was wondering whether there was another one behind it, perhaps. Nevertheless, you can pray to the bush, and it can give you a blessing. I didn't want to pray for it. May I thought maybe touching it will help, but I haven't felt anything since then. Now, this is the type of paganism that is being taught there. Isn't it incredible? Uh, wherever the so-called counter-reformation started by the Jesuits gained hold of the people, the vernacular was suppressed and the Bible kept from the laity. So eager were the Jesuits to destroy the authority of the Bible, the paper pope of the Protestants, that's what they called it, as they contemptuously called it, that they even did not refrain from criticizing its genuous and historical value. The Jesuits made war against the Protestant Bible. Before the English people could go the way of the continent and be brought to the question that great English Bible, the course of their thinking must first be changed. Much had to be done to discredit in their eyes the Reformation, its history, doctrines, documents, which they lock, looked upon as the great work of God. So this is what they had to do. They had to destroy this thinking. Now, a very interesting statement, and we'll see who it comes from in a moment. Despite all the persecution they, the Jesuits, have met with, this is a Roman Catholic speaking, they have not abandoned England, where there are a greater number of Jesuits than in Italy. Take note. Greater number of Jesuits than in Italy. There are Jesuits in all classes of society, in Parliament, among the English clergy, 
among the Protestant laity, even in the higher stations. I could not comprehend how a Jesuit could be a Protestant priest or how a Protestant priest could be a Jesuit. But my confessor silenced my scruples by telling me, Omnia munda mundes. And that St. Paul became a Jew that he might save the Jews, it was no wonder, therefore, that if a Jesuit should feign himself a Protestant for the conversion of a Protestant, but pay attention, I entreat you, to discover concerning the nature of the religious movement in England turned Puseyism. The English clergy were formerly too much attached to their article of faith to be shaken from them. You might have employed in vain all the machines set in motion by Bossuet and the Jansenists from France, that's the ones who were, you know, behind the French Revolution, the Jesuits and all of that, to reunite them with the Romish Church. So the Jesuits of England tried another plan. This was to demonstrate from history and ecclesiastical antiquity the legitimacy of the usage of the English Church whence through the exertion of the Jesuits concealed amongst its clergy might arise a studious attention to Christian antiquity. Who wrote this? Who wrote this, that the Jesuits were the priests in the Protestant churches? It was Descantus, priest at Rome, professor of theology, official theological censor of the Inquisition. The man himself tells us that it was so. Now, Romanism is known to have recently entered the Church of England. Before 1833, if you held a Mass like they hold it today, that was an anathema. If you did the things and said the things they said then, that was an anathema. Afterwards, things changed. Newman, leader of the Oxford movement, that's their university, only through the English Church can you act upon the English nation. I wish, of course, our church should be consolidated with and through and in your communion for its sake and your sake and for the sake of unity. He and his associates believed that Protestantism was the Antichrist. Okay. Faber, one of the associates of Newman, he was also in the Oxford New movement, he said, Protestantism is perishing. What is good in it is by God's mercy being gathered into the garners of Rome. My whole life, God willing, shall be one crusade against the detestable and diabolical heresy of Protestantism. So here is a war in the English church. I believe, he said, Antichrist will be infidel and arise out of what calls itself Protestantism. So he's just turning it round. And the church of Rome and England will be united in one to oppose it. Fascinating stuff. Revelation 13, 18, they changed. Uh, they didn't change the number 666, but in the revised version they have a footnote which says, and his number is 616. Just for interest's sake. Now let's get to these two gentlemen, Westcott and Hort. These are the ones that wrote, based on the ancient manuscript, the Greek text upon which all modern translations are based. Who were these two gentlemen and what did they believe? Now everything I'm going to say about them comes from books written by the sons of Westcott and Hort, publishing their own letters. So this is not what somebody says about them, this is they themselves saying what they believe. This is the horse's mouth. Wonderful to have quotes like that. They probably wish they had never done that after this lecture. Hort, as well as Westcott, rejected the idea of infallibility of the Bible, called the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, that Jesus died for you, he called it immoral. He denied the historicity of Genesis, he praised Darwin, and he denied the divinity of Christ. Does it sound familiar? Who were these people, Professor Westcott and Hort? Well, Westcott was born in 1825, Hort born in 1828. They were members of the Broad Church, the High Church Party of the Church of England. They became friends during their student days at Cambridge University, they worked together. Westcott became Bishop of Durham. And Hort is best remembered as Professor of Divinity at Cambridge University. Well, their doctrines are so Jesuit that I wouldn't be surprised if they were two of these illustrious gentlemen. Hort's view on evolution, he says, the beginning of an individual is precisely as inconceivable as the beginning of a species. It certainly startles me to find you saying that you have seen no facts which support such a view as Darwin's. But he was a Darwinist. And uh, he says, 
His book drove me to the conclusion that some kind of development must be supposed. So he was a Darwinist. This is a letter from Hort to Macmillan. He writes another last word on Darwin. I shall not let the subject drop in a hurry, or to speak more correctly, it will not let me drop. And so he continues to say that he is a Darwinist. Here is another letter from Hort to Westcott. Have you read Darwin? How I should like to talk with you about it. And another letter to Ellerton. But the book which has most engaged me is Darwin. Another letter of Hort to Ellerton. I had no idea till the last few weeks of the importance of the texts. These are the new ones that have now been found. Having read so little Greek Testament and dragged on with the villainous Textus Receptus, so he calls the received text villainous. Think of that vile Textus Receptus. Doesn't that sound like a Jesuit who hated the received text, who called it that asp, that serpent, leaning entirely on late manuscripts. There comes their argument. The Sinai text was early. It is a blessing there are such early ones. Then Hort to Reverend Ellerton, one result of our talk, I may as well tell you, he, Westcott, and I are going to edit the Greek text of the New Testament some two or three years hence, if possible. And he talks about Lachman and Tischendorf, who will supply the materials. And then uh, he says, Our object is to supply clergymen generally, schools, etc., with a portable Greek text which shall not be disfigured with Byzantine corruptions. In other words, it won't contain what the received text contains. How are they going to do this? Another letter, Westcott to Hort, as to our proposed recension of the New Testament text, our object should be, I suppose, to prepare a text for common and general use. With such an end in view, would it not be best to introduce only certain emendations? Only change it a little bit here and a little bit there? into the received text and to take note in the margin, such as seem likely or noticeable of the Griechsbach's manner. You know, if we change it completely, these British will get nervous. Let's just change it here and there and write in the margin what we think is important. So that when they read it and they read the manuscript margin, they'll say, oh, yes, we see that this probably shouldn't be that because an early manuscript, corrupt one, they don't say that, it doesn't have it. You see what I mean? That's what they've decided. I feel most keenly disgraced of circulating what I feel to be falsified copies of Holy Scripture. That's a reference to the uh, authorized version. And I'm most anxious to provide something to replace them. This cannot be any text resting solely on our own judgment, even if we were not too inexperienced to make one. So he's quite willing to write another Bible all by himself. But it must be supported by a clear and obvious preponderance of evidence. The margin will give ample scope for our own ingenuity or principle. So I suggest when you read the margins, distrust them completely. My wish would be to leave the popular received text except where it is clearly wrong, in his opinion, of course. And then he says this interesting thing. Westcott, Gorham, Benson, Bradshaw, Lourdes, and I have started the Society for the Investigation of Ghosts. Okay, they were spiritists. And all supernatural appearances and effects being all disposed to believe that such things really exist and ought to be discriminated from hoaxes and mere subjective delusions. And uh, they call it all kinds of names, cock and bull club, etc., etc. And out of this developed an incredible society. In 1882, the Society for Psychical Research was founded. In effect, it was a combination of those groups already working independently. So they work with telepathy, clairvoyance, etc. And uh, this is ancient occult wisdom. And Cambridge University Ghost Society was founded by no less a person than Edward White Benson, future Archbishop of Canterbury, together with these illustrious persons, and Darwin also attended. Now, this society, the Society for Psychical Research, is also the society 
which runs the esoteric side of the New Age movement today, with its channeling and its communication with the spirit world, all of these things are in there. Among the numerous persons and groups who were in the middle of the 19th century were making inquiries, there you will see Edward White Benson, Archbishop of Canterbury, his son, A.C. Benson, uh, will be found under the year 1851 with the following paragraph, among my father's diversions at Cambridge was the foundation of a ghost society. And then people like Lightfoot and Westcott and Hort were among the members. There it is. He was then always more interested in psychical phenomena than, than he cared to admit. Very well. So, the evolution from traditional mediumship to contemporary chan channeling has been gradual. The original spiritualism started in 1848, then came the Society of Psychical Research in Britain, and then Helena Petrovna Blavatsky took this up and continued, and she's the one that wrote, Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, the savior. Satan is the only god of this planet. That's what she wrote. That's where it came from. The secret doctrine comes from this group. Now, did they belong to any other secret societies? The answer is yes. Hort was a member of a secret society. He found time to attend the meeting of various societies and June joined the mysterious company of the Apostles. He remained always a grateful and loyal member of the secret club, which has now, 1896, become famous for the number of distinguished men who have belonged to it. In his time, the club was in a manner reinvigorated and he, this is Hort, was mainly responsible for the wording of the oath which binds the members to a conspiracy of silence. Did he belong to a secret society, yes or no? Yes. Which binds them to silence. Does this sound Masonic to you, yes or no? Well, the Prime Minister of England was also in there and he wrote the Constitution for the League of Nations where he insisted that all religions should become one and wrote an esoteric solution to that, which is also Masonic. So these people were Masons. Now, we saw yesterday that the high initiates believe that who is God? The devil is God. Satan is God. Lucifer is God. So, Mr. Hort, are you going to rewrite the Bible while you believe that Lucifer is the Son of God? Doesn't that mean that Jesus must be made less than he is, yes or no? Wouldn't they want to rewrite the Bible so that Jesus is written out of the Constitution, yes or no? Well, do we find that today, or don't we? That's the question. I'm not going to answer it tonight. We'll answer it tomorrow. We'll see for ourselves. Bring your Bibles along. Let's have a look. 1854, Hort to Reverend John Ellerton. I agree with you in thinking it is a pity that Maurice verbally repudiates purgatory. But I fully and unwaveringly agree with him in the three cardinal points of the controversy that certain uh, that eternity is independent of duration, that the power of repentance is not limited to this life. Can you believe this? He believes in purgatory and that you can repent on the other side. That it